This is Matt Nelson of the Word on Fire Institute, and I'm here now with Dr. Holly Ordway, our Fellow of Faith and Culture. So, Dr. Ordway, you are an expert on imaginative apologetics. So the first question I want to ask you is, what is the imagination? We all have one, we've all experienced it, but what is it? Well, that is such a great question because people usually think of the imagination, they think of imaginary things, you know, maybe fun things, maybe silly things, but they usually don't think of it as something really important or, or they might not. But in fact, the imagination is one of our human faculties, just like our reason and our will and our, our senses. Our imagination is actually that faculty that allows us to make sense of the world. So our senses bring in data, like I'm looking at you and I'm seeing color and shape and things like that. And our imagination is actually that, that faculty that puts that together into a picture mm -hmm. that then my reason can make a judgment on and say, ah, yes, I'm speaking with Matt Nelson and not someone who just happens to look like him, for instance. Right, right. And then my will can act on what my reason has given me. Um, oh, I'm gonna keep talking to him. He's not an imposter. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that imagination is always functioning in us all the time to pull things together to give us a meaningful picture of things. And the data might come from sensory data, might come from things that we remember or you know, things that we've read or all sorts of things can come into that. But our imagination pulls it together and gives us this meaningful picture. And that ends up being very important for apologetics and evangelization because those pictures are, are what we think about when we make judgments of, is this true, is this false? Um, do I care about this? So we often think of apologetics as being something that primarily involves the reason. How do we distinguish between imagination and reason? And when it comes to doing apologetics, how do they unify to help us essentially operate in the realm of imaginative apologetics? Well, I think the, the helpful way to think of it is that our reason is the judging capacity to say, is this true, is this false? Um, and imagination is the meaning-making faculty that gives us something to judge, something to act upon. Because if something is just a purely abstract idea, we really don't have a lot of traction with it. And that's where the imagination comes in. Um, if it's a well-fed imagination, then it can give us a more richly meaningful image if it has more material to work with. Um, and if it doesn't have much to work with or it has faulty or flawed materials, it gives us a faulty, inadequate, defective image to the reason. Um, so the imagination constructs that meaning, offers up to the reason, and then the reason can judge true, false, partly true, partly, partly false, what conclusions do I, do I draw from this? So that's the relationship between the two, the meaning making and, and the judging. Mm -hmm. And I would say the relation for apologetics is that you know we want people to be interested in the truth claims of Christianity. We want them to be realizing that they're true, uh, but we need to kind of come to grips with the fact that they can only make those judgments if they have a meaningful image to judge. And a lot of times the image that people have is actually not very meaningful. Right. So for instance, the idea that people have of God is often a very faulty, shallow image. You know, old man in the sky who blasts right. me, you know, if I, right. if I sin. Mm -hmm. um, and sin, of course, means, you know, those, all the fun things that Christians don't want me to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a very trivialized and shallow I, image of God and, and, and moral life. But if that's what people have, then that's all the reason has to work with. And so therefore, they will use their reason to say, oh, Christianity is a waste of time. That's a reason to judgment based on shallow and inadequate meaning. So we can help the reason to make better judgments if we help the imagination to construct more accurately and richly meaningful images in the first place. Doesn't guarantee that they will draw the correct conclusions, right. but it certainly helps. So is there a hierarchy or a preferred order when we're doing apologetics? Like, is it better, say, to give an argument, so enter into the realm of abstraction, give an argument, make a judgment, make ultimately a demonstration of something you believe to be true, and then form the imagination to understand the meaning of what you're trying to argue? Or is it more advantageous to form the imagination first and then use more abstract thinking and reason afterwards to clean up the way that you imagine something to be the case? Well, I think there's kind of a relationship between the two because we don't, you know, we don't do things in a kind of linear order. We're always right, yeah. kind of 
That's working with things back and forth. Um, but I would say that there is a certain primacy to the imagination because that's what gives us the material to even reason with. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have robust meaning for the terms in the argument, you know, cognitively you might say, ah, yes, those things all connect up, but it won't really go anywhere because they're just words. They're just, they're purely abstract. And so you haven't really accomplished much. So I think that working on the meaning is pretty foundational. And in part, because oftentimes we make these, these arguments and we realize that, that they don't do anything because the terms that we were using, we actually meant different things by them. Right. And again, that's a more foundational thing. And sometimes we can correct that intellectually with correcting definitions, but a lot of times it's a little bit deeper than that. It's what are the associations, what are the images that are tied to this, this concept? And once we can shift that a little bit, then the arguments are gonna be that much more effective. So what are some of the things that you would tell people to do in order to properly form? It's kind of like a conscience. You've got to form your conscience properly. When it comes to the imagination, what are some practical tips that you give people to properly form their imagination? Well, I would say, you know, exposure to the arts and to people who have engaged richly with whatever it is that that they're trying to learn about. Okay. So, for instance, if someone wants to understand more matters of faith, then you need to actually enter into the world in which those terms are meaningful. Right. Um, so that means stories and poetry and testimonies and history, mm -hmm. not just the theology textbook, but the world in which you have a context for those things. And that's one of the reasons that I think a general kind of arts education is so important, because even if someone doesn't accept the claims of Christianity, you know, 100 years ago, people at least felt it to be meaningful, even right. if they rejected it. That's true. So I think things like, you know, reading the scriptures, um, reading Christian literature, um, just history and the arts in general, it's really necessary to get that, that robust texture in which then Christianity is a thing that is worth talking about, mm -hmm. even if you want to talk about it simply as a cultural artifact. And I think that's a way that we can kind of try to win people over to, to think about the meaning of these terms, even if they don't want to become Christian, say, well, this is a cultural, cultural literacy issue. Mm -hmm. And then oh, you know, we can think, oh, by the way, if you understand the culture better, you'll be that much more able to engage with the arguments. So I think the last thing that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna comment on, but I think you'll have a couple things to say about this. Something that struck me as you're talking is how this imaginative apologetics approach really jives with the way Jesus did things in the Gospels. I mean, here we are reading stories in the Gospels of a man who's telling stories in order to make a point. Um, wouldn't you, so, so I mean, what, I guess that's a comment, but what, like, would you agree with me? Am I reading this properly? Is that a, a way of doing imaginative, imaginative apologetics by telling parables as Jesus did? Absolutely, and I think that is really the number one sort of case for doing it. It's like, well, yeah. if our Lord used that as his prime method right. of sharing the good news, um, I think we should probably imitate him. <laughs> probably. It, it's, it's a good yeah. model. Yeah. Um, and I think that's important because we can get, I think, a little bit too impatient mm. because we want people to understand. And I get that. Oh, I, I get that. But as a teacher, I know that you can't just make people learn something. You have to take them at the pace that they are ready to go. And I think we see this deep wisdom in the models that our Lord gives us because he could have just given these propositional statements, here, there you go. Right. And yet he didn't. And I think that's because he understands human nature perfectly mm -hmm. and knows that that's how we're gonna be able to enter into it. So I'd like to give the example of the parable of the prodigal son because there's a propositional truth there. God loves us and he wants us to come back to him even when we've sinned. Boom, done. How compelling is that? Just, you know, does that make you want to go to confession? Like maybe it does, great, but probably if it did, it's because it taps into existing meaning that you already have. Right. But now imagine someone who maybe has never had any experience of God, maybe has bad experiences of fatherhood, mm -hmm. you know, so the idea of God the Father actually brings up ideas of abuse and, you know, and, and um, things like that. What does it mean to say God the Father loves you? Maybe 
makes you kind of close in and makes you not want to know right. God. So here we have this story where we can kind of identify with the, with the younger brother, um, the younger son, and even kind of get like, yeah, he wants to be on his own. And, and we see that downward spiral and the details. And I love the, the details are so vivid. Even at the end, he's looking at the, what the pigs are eating and saying, man, you know, I'd be happy just to eat what the pigs are eating. And I think that's the kind of detail that will resonate with, with people who have, you know, run away from God or even if they don't know what they're doing and realize I'm in this place where I'm just at the bottom. I, I, need, to, I need someone to help me out. I need to humble myself and, and get some assistance. Mm -hmm. And then we get the image of the father running to meet the son. And that speaks so profoundly of a true father's love reaching out. And because it's in the story, it's safe. Mm -hmm. It's not tapping in directly to you know, an abusive father that that person might have or to abstract theology about God. It's the story and we can resonate with it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, after hearing that story and really reflecting on it, there's some little bit of meaning attached to God the Father loves you. And so then when you hear that, there's something more there that wasn't there before. And I think that is imaginative apologetics in a nutshell, perfectly modeled by our Lord's parables. And I think that that is a great place to stop this conversation. Um, always so insightful to talk to you about this, this area of expertise that you have. So thank you for taking a few minutes to talk about imaginative apologetics with me. My pleasure. And for all of you watching, if you want to take Holly's course on imaginative apologetics, go to wordonfire.institute and become a member. You'll find lots of other great stuff inside as well. And go to our YouTube page, the Word on Fire Institute YouTube page, where you can subscribe and access content from Holly and the rest of us at the Institute. So we'd love to see you inside.